All right, I was hoping they'd play for a little bit longer. Man, they're good this morning. God's good this morning. Are you excited to be in God's house this morning? Yeah, hey, it's so cool to be in God's house with God's people to celebrate the greatest thing we can celebrate, which is new people saying yes to Jesus. Amen. So uh, I'm up here because there's a few quick announcements that we want to make you aware of before we get into the message this morning. Uh, first thing is this, is tomorrow night we have our monthly band of brothers. Somebody asked me after the first service if I was sure it was tomorrow night, but it is the fourth Monday of the month, not the last Monday of the month. So it is tomorrow night at 6.30, there's free food, and all the men said, amen. So uh, come hang out with us, there'll be a short message, good fellowship, delicious food. Uh, the second thing is this, is um, if you are looking forward to trying to be, take the next step in your faithfulness with your finances, uh, we have a thing that we do called financial Peace University. And if those two words have never been put together for you in your life, financial and peace, you're not alone. Uh, and if you want to take the next step in learning how you can steward the gifts that God's given you, the finances that God's given you, and, and grow to help bring those in alignment with the way that God wants to bless you and help you uh, steward those things, then you should get, uh, get involved with Financial Peace University. It is a weekend workshop conference, uh, February 3rd and 4th, the first weekend of February. So uh, email the office, office at mrccnow.org, or call the office and uh, reserve your spot for that. It's definitely going to bless you if you go to that. Uh, the third thing is this. One of the best ways that we can make ourselves connected to the body of Christ, I really truly believe one of the best, maybe the best way, but definitely one of the best ways is to get involved serving in your local church. And maybe you're in the room and you're, you're feeling disconnected. You're feeling like you haven't found a place um, that you feel at home here at MRCC, I want to encourage you and maybe challenge you just a little bit that you might need to find a place to get involved and, and serve with our kids' ministry on Sunday morning or, or as a greeter or with our youth ministry or kids' ministry on Wednesday night or in many of our different ministries that we have here at MRCC. But if that's you and you're interested in more information on how to connect to the body of Christ better uh, by joining a ministry team, out in the lobby when the service is over, uh, the pastoral staff will be out there at that table in the lobby. We'll hang out, and if you have questions, we'll answer questions and definitely make a quick connection for you on how you can connect to the church better through serving. Uh, the last thing and the reason that I am up here this morning is uh, one of the reasons that I'm here on staff and one of my great passions is helping people uh, in their 20s and 30s make connections to God's family. If, if you are in your 20s and 30s, maybe you're single, maybe you're a couple, maybe you, you would like to be a couple and you want to bring somebody with you, uh, or maybe you have kids. W whatever of those stages of life you're in, I, I don't care. I just don't want you to do life alone, amen? And so um, today at 1230, a couple of my friends, they came to me uh, not that long ago, friends from MRCC, and they told me their story about how it took them years to find find a meaningful connection at MRCC. And they, they said to me, they said, Darius, what can we do to make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else? And I said, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. And they were so faithful to be willing to be a part of this. So uh, today we're gonna host a lunch at their house. And um, if you want uh, information on how to get there, the address, email me, Darius at mrccnow.org or come find me when the service is over and I would love for you to come and hang out and connect if and this is if you have not connected before maybe you've been coming to church for a while you have a group that you're a part of you're part of a ministry team um, that's great we'll see you at a different time but if you are, have never made a good connection at MRCC you're in your 20s and 30s please come out today uh, at 12 30 have lunch with us stop by we'll feed you and your family and uh, we would love to spend some time with you now uh, go ahead and get your Bible out out, turn to the book of Luke, and we're going to get ready for the message this morning. Thank you, Pastor Darius. Thank you, worship team. And, and thank you, everyone, for being here to celebrate with us on a baptismal Sunday. And gosh, huge thanks. Everybody turn around and wave to the very patient and gracious people who are sitting in the foyer. They couldn't find a seat in the sanctuary. Yeah. Um, gosh, thanks for your, your patience and your, your graciousness out there. We appreciate that. Um, you know, church, before we open the word this morning, I, I just want to celebrate with you and encourage you to remember 
that as each of us follow Jesus in our lives, we become part of other people becoming believers. And every person, again, I said it before, who, who makes that decision, they're the product of a whole lot of people playing a part. I think back in my own life over a number of people who just played a, a little part and together they helped me come to the Lord. And Jesus says that when we persevere in that, when we continue in that, understanding that God is using us as a team, as a family, then he guarantees that we will make a difference, that our lives will be filled with meaning and significance for the kingdom. Luke 8, 15 says, uh, those with a noble and good heart who hear the word retain it and by persevering produce a crop. So thank you. Thank you for paying the bills. Thank you for watching the parking lot. Thank you for cleaning. Thank you for serving kids. Thank you for doing all the things that help other people uh, believe. Luke chapter 3 this morning. You will remember that we set ourselves in 2023 uh, to take a long road trip with Jesus from the beginning to the end of Luke's gospel with some short detours into the other gospels, but we're using Luke's gospel as a framework because it's chronological. The others aren't always. And the whole purpose is that Jesus teaches us that there's a lot of fake Jesuses out there. And by paying attention, we can know the difference between the real one and the fake one. And he wants us to. He invites us to do that and to experience the joy and blessing of that. We're in Luke chapter 3 this morning, after well after the Christmas story. And, and let me begin by saying this. I have to go kind of fast because we had 16 people to baptize all morning, but half of them were in this service. So turn yourself up to high speed and here we go, all right? There are gifts in life. Maybe you've noticed this. I imagine you probably have. But there are gifts in life that we don't think we want until we get them. There are things that we say, I don't, I don't want that. Until we receive that gift, and then we're thankful for it. Then we feel differently about it. You will remember that about three weeks ago, I had this gallbladder crisis thing. It was awful. It was terrible. I ended up in the hospital for a couple of days. Thought I was going to have a surgery. Many of you prayed. I didn't have to. I'm over that feeling great now. And when I was going through it, if, if you've been through that, it's miserable. You're in pain. You're vomiting all the time. You can't eat anything. And I remember thinking all the way through it, this is not fun. But then at the end of it, those 10 pounds I've been trying to lose for 10 years, they're gone, right? I got up and everybody's walking around going, Pastor Greg, you're looking good. You're looking slim. You're like, you thinned up a little, didn't you? Now, I wouldn't recommend that method, <laughs> and I, I really don't want to do it again, but, but, you know, afterwards, I was like, okay, all right, you know, I can, I can go with this. There are gifts we don't think we want until we get them. I remember when I was a young man and really getting into basketball and getting passionate about it, playing all the time, and then I had a massive knee injury, blew out all the ligaments in my knee, had to have the full nine-yard surgery, and I remember thinking, oh, I'm never going to be able to play well anymore. I'm never going to be able to enjoy this, but a funny thing happened. After I got the surgery and I started to go back, I stopped relying so much on being able to run really fast and jump really high, and I learned about a million other ways to do things, and I actually became a much better player after the injury. That's not uncommon. Many people say that, but, you know, I, I didn't want that injury, and yet afterwards I ended up being thankful that it happened because I learned so much more about the game and so much more about how to play the game. Some gifts we don't think we want until we get them. And one more example, I remember when our son was a teenager, and sometimes it's tough with parents and teenagers in those years, and we were going through a rough patch, and one day, in, in the middle of all that struggle, you know, I, I broke down and revealed my vulnerability and my frailty to my son, something that I never set out to do because I thought being a good dad meant never making a mistake in front of your son. And then I learned that no, when I made a mistake, when I exposed my frailty and vulnerability, then I became somebody he could relate to. Then I became someone he could aspire to be like, whereas before it was just, you know, dad's perfect and never makes a mistake. It wasn't a gift I wanted, but after receiving it, I was glad I did. Now, here's why I share that with us this morning. God wants to talk to us this morning about repentance. And repentance is a thing that most of us think we want to avoid. To say, I'm wrong, I'm on the wrong track, I need to go back and change direction. 
I need to have my mind change. What I was thinking, what I was feeling was not the right thing. Most of us don't want that. We don't seek that. But God says it's a gift that after you've received it, you're glad you did. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 puts it this way. Godly sorrow. Nobody wants sorrow. Yet godly sorrow brings repentance. The word means to change your mind. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. In other words, it's a gift we often think we don't want until we receive it. And then we realize, oh man, that was what I wanted and needed all along. As Jesus was getting ready to really launch into his ministry in earnest, there was a prelude. There was a preparation. There was a setup. And that was the coming of John the Baptist, the other character, the other baby in the Christmas story. And John the Baptist came for a very specific reason. John came, in his own words, to prepare the way for Jesus. And what does that preparation consist of? It consists of repentance. You see, church, here's the big idea this morning. When we allow ourselves to receive the gift of repentance... Then we open our lives to the experience of God. John came to call the people to repentance so that they could experience the greater reality with God that was the coming of Jesus. And that's what we find going on here in Luke chapter 3. Let's move to verse 1 and we'll move through this passage down through verse 20 this morning. Here's what the Bible says. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, when Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, when his brother Philip was tetrarch, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonias, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, not in Texas, by the way, in case you were wondering, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert, and he began to preach a message. Now, all that detail about who was ruling where sounds kind of alien and foreign to our ears, but actually what Luke was doing was marking a specific date on the calendar. In those days, you kept track of time, you remembered history by who was ruling where and when. And Luke, at the very beginning of Luke's gospel, says, hey guys, this gospel I'm writing to you is something that I've searched out like an investigative journalist. I've gone and checked all the stories. I've interviewed the eyewitnesses. I wanted to get the straight scoop, the historical, factual reality of the faith. And so I want to tell you what I found. And what I found is that Jesus isn't just a, a beautiful story or a mystical idea. He was a real human being, lived at a real time and place, walked among us. At a See, the Christian faith is not one option for mystically minded people. It is the truth. And our reaction to it is not a choice between different mystical options. It's a choice to either be honest with the truth or to not be honest with the truth. Here's how Luke put it. He said, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good to me also to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, his patron, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. When somebody says, you know what, all that religion stuff, nobody can really know, they're just making it up. Luke says, guess what? The exact opposite is true. This is real historical fact. And when somebody says, you know, no, but there's too many questions, ask yourself whether those people have seriously asked the questions and look for the answers, because they're there. The test of the gospel isn't a test of whether I'm mystical or not. It's a test of whether I'm willing to be honest with God and honest with myself. Romans chapter 1 says he's there. Everybody knows it. The only question is whether we'll admit it. And so Luke says, hey, I want to tell you the straight scoop, the historical facts, the compelling truth about this man, Jesus. And he says it begins, the public ministry part, with the coming of this guy, John. Verse 2, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert, and he went into all the country around the Jordan. Here's where this repentance thing comes in. Preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In other words, inviting people to make a public confession that they're changing their ways, that they're going to choose God's way going forward. He invited them to publicly turn away from doing what was wrong, what was not right in God's eyes, what we call sin, 
John came inviting people to receive the gift of the baptism of repentance. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, captured in what John is doing and in God's plan leading up to his son is this idea. Repentance prepares us to experience God. Let me say that again. Repentance, the changing of my mind about things, right and wrong, that prepares us to experience God. Repentance isn't an end in itself. God doesn't say repent so you can be under my thumb and I can keep control and I can be the tyrant of your life. No, he says, I want you to repent so you can receive the greater gift of my son in your life. Repentance is a gift that enables us to experience God. If you're hungry for more of God, let me invite you to ask yourself where and how he's seeking to change your mind and why you're resisting. You know, he steps into our world not dancing to the tune of the culture or popular opinion. He comes in and says, let me tell you the truth. Here's what's real. Here's what isn't. Here's what's good. Here's what's not. Here's what will bless you. Here's what won't. And our ability to receive the gift of his grace and of his leadership in our lives depends on our willingness to repent. Let, let me just ask you as your fellow human being, when was the last time you let God change your mind about something? When was the last time you let him, you said, oh, wow, I have thought this all that time, and I was actually wrong. There's a different thing that God is saying than what I thought. That's what John comes to do. He says, verse 16, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In other words, this is really important, church. Repentance is not an end in itself. When God says to you or me, hey, I want to change your mind about something, he doesn't just want us to cooperate in order that we're submissive. That's, that's just the door opening into the blessing. What he wants us to do is change our minds to repent so that we can experience the greater gift that depends on our willingness to receive it. Repentance, if you will, opens your eyes to the reality of God right in the middle of your life. You know, we have a, a little Border Collie dog at home. Her name's Eleanor. And uh, Ellie loves nothing more than when mom or dad comes home from work. When, see, I just betrayed how lame we are. We call ourselves mom and dad for the dog. But anyway... <laughs> She's just nothing but excited about that, right? And uh, at a certain time of day, she knows Rhonda's coming home from work, and she'll start looking out the window. But she's got, like, the attention span of a gnat, right? So she'll look out the window. Oh, she's not there. And then she gives up and goes somewhere else. I say, no, Mom's coming. Look out the window. Oh, she's And then she gets bummed, and she lays by the door. She's never coming home, right? And what's funny is from where I am sometimes in the kitchen, I can see out the window, and I can see Rhonda pull in. And Rhonda's there. And Ellie loves nothing more than to run out and greet her, but Ellie's not looking, so Ellie doesn't know. She's there, but Ellie doesn't know. And then I'll say, Ellie, Mama's home. Jumps up, runs to the window, tail starts wagging. Now she's leaping. She wants out. She runs across the yard to greet her. Mom was always there, but when Ellie stopped looking, she didn't know it. <laughs> In the same way, God says repentance, Greg, opens your heart, your mind, your life to the fact that I'm right in the middle of your world, that I'm here. Repentance prepares us to experience God. You know, nobody thinks we want to repent. We think of it as something to avoid. But in fact, it's a gift that enables us to experience something greater that God has for us. That's what John has come to do. That's what the Spirit of God is still doing here and now. Let me ask you again. When was the last time you let God change your mind about sexuality, about how you treat your enemy, about how you relate to your boss at work, about how you treat your wife or your husband or your kids or your parents, when was the last time you let God change your mind about how you relate to your enemies? See, there's a, there's a host of repentance available to us. The word literally means in Greek, metanoia. It's a compound word to change the mind. Because the changing of the mind leads to the change of behavior. And God dwells in the midst of that. So John comes with this message of repentance, giving this gift that we don't know we want until we receive it, but which we then appreciate beyond measure.
But as he comes to do that, we don't have much time, as he comes to do that, uh, we also encounter a theme that starts here but will run all the way through all the Gospels, indeed the whole New Testament, until we get to the end. And that is that there is a difference between doing religious stuff and experiencing God in reality. John knows this. So big crowds come out to do this public baptism of repentance with him because it is popular. You know, you think human beings didn't have TikTok back in the first century. They had the same spirit. They had the same attitude. Everybody do the same thing, right? So their crowds are coming out. And John says, hey, wait, guys, time out. Listen to what he says. John said to the crowds, the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. You know, everybody's gifted. John's not really gifted for the greeting ministry in the foyer. We wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't put him out there. He's got a different set of gifts. But he says, you brood of vipers, and listen to why. He says, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? And then he says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, if you're going to do this stuff, be serious about it. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Let your mind really be changed. Don't just come out here and participate in the latest hot trend on social media. No, no, no. Say, you know what? I'm going to get real with God. I'm really going to let him change my mind and change my heart. And then he says something challenging for many of us who've grown up in the Christian subculture. Listen to what he says. He says, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. See, the Jews in those days said, hey, we're descended from Abraham. We're automatically God's people. We're all good. We're in. We don't have to worry about a thing. John said, that is exactly the attitude that makes you not God's people. He said, well, we're Jewish. God's not impressed. Jews have to come to Jesus just like Gentiles do. Sometimes we say, oh, well, Israel's always God's people. Not when they turn away from Jesus. John says, hey, if you're going to come out for repentance, understand you don't get a free pass because you were born in a certain place, because you were raised in a certain way, because you came from a certain background. This is about you and God, personally, individually. He says, you've got to get real with him. He can turn stones into children of Abraham. But sons of God are born out of repentance. We really need to grasp this because sometimes... Sometimes we can fall into the trap of going to church just to kind of hang out with the family, your boyfriend, the girlfriend, you know, neighbors, people we met, you know, just kind of to hang. And God says, no, if you're going to come, come to let your mind and heart be changed. Come to let Jesus change you. Because only in that will you experience the reality of the Christian faith. Real faith happens when we change our minds. It's when I admit that I am a sinner that I discover God as a Savior. Can I just say humbly to you as your fellow human being, have you ever gotten real with that? And said, you know what, God, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. You know, repentance makes us aware of the reality of our situation. Most of us don't think of human beings as by nature being condemned to eternal separation from God. And the Bible says that's the reality. And repentance, though, restores us to him. Repentance brings us right back to him. All you have to do is say, like you want your kids to say to you, Mom, I was wrong. Dad, I was wrong. I'm sorry. God says that's how you begin to experience me. You know, I have a couple of buddies who tell me a story of fly fishing out in central Washington some years ago, and, and they were both working on opposite side of the river. They'd been going together for a lot of years, uh, fly fishing, not going together. And out there, they had, they had a, a, a kind of an agreement. They would separate, because fly fishing is all about the solo zen and nature and being there with, by yourself and quiet and all that. And so they're fishing on opposite sides of the river, and they kind of had a pact. When they go out in the morning, they don't chatter constantly. They fish, and then they can come back and talk at lunch. But in the middle of the morning, my friend's buddy on the other side of the river was trying to get his attention. <laughs> and he said, what? He said, come, 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 come. It's like, what? Come into the river? Yeah, come into the river. Come now. He's like, what? what do you, well, first of all, why are you bothering me? We're fly fishing. Second, why would I go into the river? You know, his friend. And so eventually he's like, well, why? And his friend looked. And my buddy turned around to find that about eight feet behind him, a great big old giant cougar was sitting on a rock looking down at him. And he'd been trying to hit his fly rod with his paw. And suddenly my brother under, or my friend understood why his buddy was calling him over. In the same way, God says, church, hear me. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. 
Hell is real. Repentance is how we escape it. It's how we turn to God instead of turn away from God. And then suddenly we realize what a gift it is and how much we need it. That's what John's message is all about, to prepare us for repentance. Now, we've only got a couple minutes, so let me finish. The beautiful thing about repentance is it's always simpler than we think. It's always simpler than we think. A lot of us think repentance would evolve some massive program that we got to get encyclopedic control of and five, no, no, no. It's the little things that manifest as repentance. The crowd, when they heard John's invitation to repent, said, okay, we're ready to have our mind changed. What should we do? And instead of laying something heavy on them, he lays something simple on them. See, since the very beginning, the devil's game is to get you to think that God demands all sorts of things from you that he actually doesn't. G.K. Chesterton put it this way. Watch his temptation of Eve, and you'll see this in play. Chesterton put it this way. He said, the reason the Ten Commandments are so short and simple is because God forbids so little and permits so much. He just says, hey, there's a few things. Stay away from these things. Turn away from these things. But then there's a whole lot of other stuff that I want you to enjoy and receive. In the Genesis story, there's only one tree in the whole garden they can't eat from. Thousands of trees, just one not to eat from. The devil comes and says, did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees? No, he didn't. It's a lie. Repentance is always simpler than we think. And, and so when they say to John, what should we do? John answers. He says, simple. The man who has two tunics should share with him who has none. The one who has food should do the same. If you got extra, share. Think of your fellow human being. How can you help? People at work, people in your neighborhood, people in your family, people you go to school with. Who, who can you help? If you've got extra, share. You know, so, well, exactly how much and when? Stop it. Find somebody to share with. Bless with them. Uh, bless them. That's what repentance looks like, a changed attitude. The tax collectors also came. They said, teacher, what should we do? He doesn't say, resign from tax collecting because after all, you're cooperating with the wicked Roman government and we need to overthrow that. No, he says, just, hey, tax collect honestly. Don't collect more than you should. Just keep it simple. Just have integrity in what you're doing. Some soldiers ask him, what should we do? He doesn't say, hey, become a pacifist and quit the military. No, he says, don't extort money. Don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Don't take advantage of your authority and position. Be content with your pay. Be an honorable soldier. See, church, the devil wants you to not repent because you think it's complicated when the reality is repentance is how you're going to treat your wife or your husband when you walk away from here today. Repentance is your attitude when you go to work tomorrow morning or tonight or whenever. Repentance is the little things. It's where the power is. And when we choose it, when we choose it, then we open ourselves to the experience of God. We're almost done. I want to share a story with you. But here's the thing. When was the last time you let God change your mind? You know, we live in a world that has a whole lot of ideas about a whole lot of things. And a lot of them are contrary to what God says. Maybe you need to have your mind changed about your sexuality. God says, I know what's really up here. Listen to me. Maybe you need to have your mind changed about your ambitions or about your view of marriage. You say, well, in my opinion, sleeping with my boyfriend before we get married, that's just what I want to do. God says, I'd like to change your mind about that. It's not the foundation for the relationship that you really in your heart want. Maybe it's with regard to your finances. You say, you know what? I don't want God messing around in my finances. God says, I do want to mess around in your finances. So I want to bring you to a place of blessing. I want to teach you what they're for. I want you to experience me through your finances. Will you let me change your mind about that? Maybe it's about church. You know, hey, gosh, church is just a thing I check in every now and then when I need a little pick-me-up. And God says, you know what? I want you to build a rhythm in your life of worshiping me weekly. Will you let me change your mind about that? You know, there's a million things. We could, we could go on and on about these things. But when was the last time that you let God change your mind? Repentance prepares us to experience him. It connects us with God. Listen again. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Some of the best gifts we'll ever receive is the ones we don't think we want until we have them. Let me finish with a story. The October 2000 edition of the Chicago Sun-Times tells the story 
of two airline passengers who thought they knew what they needed, but they were wrong. You see, these two passengers convinced U.S. Airlines that they needed to bring along a 300-pound therapeutic pig on the plane flight to overcome anxiety. And when they made the suggestion, at first the airline refused, but they raised such a ruckus and made such a stink, and there are legal allowances for this kind of thing, and pretty soon the airline had to give in and let them bring the pig on the plane. It was a flight from Chicago to Seattle, six hours, and as you might imagine, it didn't go well. <laughs> the pig got agitated during takeoff and squealed, thrashed, and thumped around, terrifying other passengers. The entire time it was on the plane for six hours, the two people who brought it were desperately trying to keep it under control, wrestle it into submission, but it remained, in the words of one of the flight attendants, enormous, stinky, loud, and rude. <laughs> And things hit a crescendo when, when they came into their landing at the Seattle airport. The pig really went nuts, not enjoying what was happening. It broke free, charged up and down the aisles, biting, bashing into people, generally, forgive me, having a cow on the airplane. Passengers stood on their seats in terror. It took four big guys from the ground crew to come onto the plane and drag the pig off by its legs. The two passengers who brought it afterwards says... Maybe we didn't know what we really needed on the plane. Maybe there's a 300-pound pig going nuts in your life, crashing around, making a mess, dominating you, controlling you. God says, hey, I got a better idea. Will you let me change your mind about it? Will you let me change your mind about what you need, what you think you need? If you'll let me change your mind, you'll open your heart to experiencing me. You'll open your life to experiencing me. When was the last time you let God change your mind? Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? Father, we thank you for your word this morning that teaches us that repentance is a gift that you offer to us. God, some of us, we just, we don't think we want that gift. And yet you're telling us we really do. God, give us faith and courage to choose the gift of repentance, to say to you today, God, I, I want your way, not mine. God, I want your way in my marriage, at my work, in my relationship to my enemies, in my relationship to my neighbors, in my relationship with my boyfriend, my girlfriend in my relationship with your church. God, I want your way, not my way. The moment that we choose that repentance, we open ourselves to receive the greater gift of the experience of God. Lord, send us from here aware that you're inviting us to receive the gift of repentance. We pray for that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Kick your neighbor if they drifted off. Let them know we're ending service. There are gifts we don't think we want until we have them. Repentance is like that. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God. Tell someone you love them. Have a great afternoon.